And our topic for today, we're going to be talking about the gift that nobody wants. How many of you think that pain is a gift? None of us, right? It's uncomfortable. It's just, you know, something that we want, don't want to deal with. But, you know, perhaps as we go through this lecture, what I'm going to ask you to do is to have an open mind to the perspective that pain can actually be a blessing for us. And as we go through this, before we jump into our lecture, is that okay if we say a word of prayer? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day and your blessings. Thank you for your love towards us. And as we come together to learn from you, we pray that you speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you jump, if you, if you think about pain and you th consider, you know, how can it be a blessing to you? That's the first question that we ask ourselves. And we mentioned that pain is the gift that nobody want, wants because it's something uncomfortable, it's something that we don't like to deal with. Why? Because it's something that, you know, we personally, I don't believe we were actually made for it. But when you think about pain, what is the definition that you have of pain? What do you think pain is? Ow. Ow. Alarm system. Yeah, alarm system. What else? You know, pain, yes, that's right. All those things are correct. I like this definition that I have it up in the screen, that it says, a localized or generalized unpleasant bodily sensation that causes mild to severe physical discomfort, an emotional distress, and typically results from bodily disorder. It's interesting that when we think about pain, a lot of times we think about how uncomfortable it is, but we forget what it's actually trying to tell us. There is something underlying to that pain. But also, most of the things that we'll be discussing in this lecture, it comes from a little book called The Gift of Pain, The Gift Nobody Wants. And this little book was uh, wrote, um, written by um, Paul, um, Paul Brand. He was a doctor in three different continents. And, you know, he was a missionary doctor. And as he was in these continents, he discovered one thing, that people dealt with pain in different ways in different continents. He worked with... Um, people that had leprosy, he worked with people that had diabetes, and he realized that in certain situations, because the fact that they did not have pain, that was actually causing them much more harm. And we continue about saying, pain is no invading enemy. A lot of times the first thing we do when we feel pain is open a cabinet, take, take a pill, right? And we never stop to think, wait a second, what is this pain trying to tell me? Where is it coming from? Is there anything that it could be relating to it? It says, pain is no invading enemy. It is a loyal messenger dispatched by my own body to alert me to some danger. Can you imagine this building is on fire and the first thing you do, you turn off the fire alarm and you don't go for the fire extinguish. Does that make sense? It's like if I open a faucet right here and the room is overflowing and there is a faucet running. And then you say, oh, I got to mop the floor. And you let the faucet continue dripping. Does that work? No. What do you need to do first? You got to close the faucet because if you continue mopping, you are never going to get nowhere. And sometimes we are just like that in the way that we view pain. Because if we think that the first thing we must do is to, you know, take something to relieve the pain, we forget and we lose the message that is trying to be bring. Does that make sense? So think about the story. You have a son and you are making cookies, you know, healthy cookies, right? You've been learning about healthy things here. So, you know, you are making cookies and then, you know, think of your son's name is, for example, let's say George, and George is there in the kitchen, you know, going around and he's smelling, the, you know, the cookies and he goes into the oven, he opens the oven, and when he opens the oven, he reaches out for the, the cookies that is in the oven. Guess what will happen? He's going to get burned and he's going to take his hands right off of it. Why? Because he felt the pain and if, if he, he can't keep holding because there is something telling him that my hand hurts and it's burning. Now imagine the scenario that, you know, George, he had a condition called leprosy. Leprosy, what happens is that, you know, especially in the peripheral, you lose sensations, especially in the peripheral area. And now you stop feeling pain. And now, you know, leprosy is also most common in um, ages between 5 to 15 and over 30 years old. You know, this is usually something that is most seen in third world countries. 
but it's something that, you know, just to give us a perspective, now George is going there, but he has leprosy. He doesn't have a good sensations on his peripheral nervous system. He's going to reach out for that pen, and guess what's going to happen? He's not going to take his hand off. He might even perhaps put, put the pen up, and then he realizes, and the only way that he's going to realize that he hurts himself is probably when he smells that something is burning, which is actually his hand. Now, do you think pain is a blessing in that case? Do you think, you know, because, because George had the lack of pain, what happened? He seriously burned. And a lot of times we are just like that. Maybe we don't have conditions that affect our, you know, the periphery, our, our limbs. But the first thing we do, if every time we feel pain, we take a pill, we are just like George. We are just masking the problem. And what's the underlying cause of it? Now, I'm not against taking things for pain, but I think even herbs and those things, they can be misapplied. We can be only masking the, the problem instead of looking for the solution. And it says, in the modern view of pain, pain is an enemy that must be expelled. This approach has a crucial, dangerous flaw. Once regarded as an enemy, not a warning signal, what happens? Pain loses its power to instruct. If every time we feel pain, the first thing that we do is to try to, you know, just send it away, expel it, we are never going to address the real cause of our issues. And if we, if we never address the real cause of the issues, we always be, you know, running around and chasing our tails and we're not going to get nowhere. Silencing pain without considering its message, it's like disconnecting a ringing fire alarm to avoid receiving bad news. You know, the building may be burning, and the first thing that we do, you don't want to address the fire. You just go and turn off the fire alarm. You know, a few, a few months back, we had a, an, an instance at the dorm that the fire alarm started ringing. And, you know, everyone woke up. Now, my first reaction, do you know what was my first reaction? No. Nope. My first reaction to the fire was not to get out of my house. I was trying to press the button so I could silence and go back to sleep. <laughs> and afterwards, I realized, wait a second, something might be burning in the house. I might as well just get out. But we are so used to just, you know, just ignoring the problem itself that we forget about how to truly deal with the solution. And we continue by reading, the path to help for an individual or a society must begin by taking pain into account. Instead, we silence pain when we should be straining our ears to, he to hear it. We work too long and we take things to you know, make us feel calmer. And we look upon pain as the illness rather than the symptom. And guess what's going to happen if we look at pain being the illness? We're never going to address our real issues. We are never going to get to the real cause. Why? Because we are always addressing the symptoms and not the cause itself. And we continue by reading, rather than trying to solve pain by eliminating it, we must learn to listen to it and then manage it. You know, a lot of times we want to manage before we actually want to know what the pain is causing. A lot of times we want to, you know, just get rid of the pain so we can get along in our days. But what we, we forget is that just like the fire alarm, if we keep turning the fire alarm off, guess when we are going to realize we're just going to realize that something was on fire when the house is already burned. And a lot of time that happens to us as well. If over and over we continue silencing pain, guess what will happen? We only going to realize, you know, when we are very, very sick of something. Whether silence pain and destroy the body or listen to pain and preserve the body. You know, the choice we have today is between choosing to you know, deal with the solution or, you know, choose to just ignore the cause of the problem that we have. But when, we, when I ask myself, what does it mean to listen to pain? Because we're talking about, you know, we shouldn't be just putting pain aside, we shouldn't be expelling it from our bodies, but what does it mean to listen to pain? What do you think it means, listening to the pain? It's about finding the cause. You know, the question that comes is, how do we actually listen to pain? And what does it mean? And first of all, 
how can we do this? I want to bring up a few questions. First of all is, is there a pattern to this pain? Now, if your pain always happens when you do something, most likely, for example, if you, you are having pain after you eat, is most likely, you know, because you are having something you ate, correct? If you are having pain after, you know, your neck pain after you, you know, slept in the wrong position, maybe you can just address the cause and the pain will stop. Does it occur at regular times? Does it seem to happen when I'm stressed? Does it seem to happen when I am overwhelmed? Does it seem to relate with my job? Did you know that the 90%, 60 to 90% of the causes why people go to the doctor is stress related? It's not really because they have a physical issue. What seems to alleviate the pain? When you stop doing certain movements, does the pain get better? Or when you don't eat certain things? Am I worried, bitter, or angry? You know, you would be surprised, but a lot of times our pains and aches, they can be caused by, you know, our emotional, our emotional health. Am I, am I anxious about the future? You know, this is one of the things as well. When we are stressed and we are anxious about the future and we, you know, might have something to eat at that time, we're actually gonna most likely have, you know, stomach ache and things like that because our body is not producing the amount necessary of um, acid to digest. Am I angry with God? Do you think that has to do with pain as well? You know, a lot of times we kind of disconnect our physical bodies to, you know, we disconnect the spiritual part from our physical illness. But I believe as we connect both, that's when we can actually reach for, you know, a holistic point of view. Now, let's talk about the different volumes of pain. First of all, as you read there with me, what does it say? It whispers. It whispers to us in the early stages. It's like when, for example, your a hand goes numb or you are walking, you got some new shoes on and you're walking and then you start feeling like, you know, those shoes, they just don't feel right, is the discomfort. Subconscious level, we sense a slight discomfort and change position in bed or change the way that we are walking. That's the whisper stage. Now, after, it says that pain speaks. So it gets louder. Why it gets louder? Because you are not listening to it and your body is trying to tell you something, so it gets louder, be louder because the danger increases. It speaks louder as the danger increases. A hand grows tender after raking leaves or a foot grows sore in new shoes. And lastly, what pain will try to do is shout. It says pain shouts when the danger becomes severe. It forces a person to limp or even to hop or quit quitting, running all together. You know, the part of the pain that is so uncomfortable to us is the part that is most effective at protecting us. Because can you imagine if pain was like a notification in your phone? It just comes up and say, oh, you have a pain in your foot. And guess what we will do? Silence. You're just gonna put it aside. So the part that is so uncomfortable about pain, that's the part that is most effective at protecting us. So we spoke about these three volumes, and now the question is, is that if we silence pain at any of those stages, what will happen? We'll hurt, we'll hurt ourselves and we will not get the message that is trying to communicate to us. I want to tell you, tell you a little story about a basketball player, Bob Gross. So he was, you know, the star in one, um, one of the NBA teams, and there was an NBA basketball game that he was playing, and he had hurt himself, you know, very badly. He had an ankle injury, but he was the star of the team. He must play. So what the doctors did, they came to him and said, listen, we need you to play. We need to win this game. So what we'll do, we're going to inject you with a very strong um, painkiller called Marking, and injected in his feet, in in, in his foot in three different places. And as he injected that, that was interesting because he went in the game and he stopped feeling the pain. And you probably think, oh, that's such a great thing. But as he's running up and down the court, he went for a rebound once, and when he went for the rebound, it heard a loud snap throughout all the arena. And as the loud snap was heard, he didn't feel anything. He kept walking up and down, he ran up and down twice, and then he eventually just fell into the floor. 
By canceling out Payne's warning system, Gross had laid himself open to an injury that caused permanent damage and prematurely ended his career. You know, and how can we apply this to our lives? Just like, you know, Bob Gross, it may not be something as severe as that. But if we keep putting, you know, silencing pain over and over and over and not getting to the cause, we are actually going to be causing us more harm and we eventually, you know, we can um, cause some serious problems for, you know, our future. And I think this is such an important point for us to think because all of us, you know, just like Bob Gross, he felt no pain. But you know, he still had broken a bone and he ended his career prematurely because of that. Now, when we talk about pain, it's also good to mention one thing, which is the stages of pain. Just like Bob Gross, he decided to just silence the pain at that point because he thought that it was most important for him, you know, to be at the game and also because he, he had to play. He was being, you know, pushed to play. But unfortunately, we see the consequences that that had not only in his life, but ended up ended, you know, ending his career. Stages of pain. Now, it's important for us to understand the stages of pain. Why? Because there is two stages that we cannot do much things about it. But we can do something about the third stage. As we read the first stage of pain, and for us, in order to truly address the issue, we need to understand the stages and how it works. In the first stage, there is a pain signal, an alarm that goes off when nerve endings in the periphery sense danger. So the first stage is when is the alarm. I, call it, I like to call the alarm part because the first stage is when your body is, OK, I need to do something about this pain. It's like the fire alarm. The second stage, it says that the second stage of pain, the spinal cord and the base of brain act as a spinal gate to sort out which of the many millions of signals deserve to be forwarded as a message to the brain. You know, our bodies is an amazing machinery. You know, we can see it and we can look and we see how God has created us. We have millions of these, you know, nerve um, signals that goes in to our spinal cord and it's in the spinal cord that it gets sorted out. Okay, we got to address this pain. Okay, this is not as important. And that's where you have all the messages coming. So the first stage, we have the alarm. The second one is the message. You know, the message comes to us in order for us to do something about it. And the third stage is the response. It says the final stage of pain takes place in the higher brain, which sorts through the pre-screen messages and decides on a response. Our bodies, at that point, it decides what to do. Now, are we going to release things into, in order to, you know, release indoor things? We're going to release things in order to lessen the pain? Are we just going to put up something out there in order to, um, to lessen the pain? Or what are we going to do? Our bodies goes through all of that in order to tell us. So we have the first stage, which is the alarm, the second, which is the message, and the last one, which is the... Um, the, the response, correct. Thank you so much. Now, we want to talk about pain variants. Now, let me just drink some water. We talk about pain variants because those are the things that will um, be related with, you know, our pains and things that will make our pains actually worse. First of all, we can all agree that, you know, depending on the pain, some pains we have it's not, you know, as important we may feel because they are not as, you know, as strong or things like that, or they are not as severe. So the pain, a severity of the pain will vary. Also, the personality makeup. Some people, a lot of times, they tolerate more pain than others. But also our surroundings. You know, it's interesting, but just like um, Bob grows, there is a lot of athletes when they are playing and they are excited, they don't really feel the pain, even though they hurt themselves. And so the surroundings, the place where we are, will also affect our pain. I want to tell you a, another um, story here. You know, um, imagine a girl, and this girl is running, and then as she's running, she fell. And because she fell, she started, you know, crying, she scraped her knee, and she's, you know, screaming that she has pain, and etc., etc. But now we put the same thing that this girl is running, but now we put her into a race. 
think about that this girl is in a race and she's running. If, she's fa if she falls and scrapes her knee, she's still going to get up and going to continue running because of the adrenaline and everything, the surrounding. But now, as she finishes the run, guess what happened with the pain? It's going to start back. And then as the pain starts back, that's when mom, mom becomes necessary. Because mom is going to come and is going to put a bandage, is going to, you know, saying that everything is okay, that's fine. But also when she goes back to bed, because there is not many messages coming, guess what happened with the pain? It gets worse because there is not a lot of messages coming. Because she was running, as she was running during the, during the race, she didn't really care about the pain because at that point her mind was in the race. But now because everything that she's thinking about is the pain, the pain gets worse. And it's saying, the girl's perception of the pain varies accordingly to how the pain was blocked at stage two, the messages, the competing input. There is a lot of messages coming to her brain and that she's actually not even thinking about the pain. And at stage three, by the mother's resources to calm the anxiety. And why do I think this is so important? Is because just like we have the pain variants, things that makes pain to vary in our bodies, we have things that are called the pain intensifiers. Those things that make pain to be worse. And you would be surprised, but a lot of those things are things that we actually deal in an emotional level. They are responses that increase the perception of pain in the conscious mind. So they don't necessarily increase the pain, but increases our perception to it. And then we feel like we have more pain. Pain intensifiers, what are they? Fear, hopelessness, loneliness, guilt, anger. All those things are related to intensifying the pains and aches that we have. And it's so interesting, but a lot of times we don't think that our emotion, in an emotional level, we're going to be affected in our bodies. But they actually pay, play a great part on that. And I think it's also important for us to talk about one of the greatest of all of them, which is fear. Especially during the pandemic, we saw a lot of this because we, you know, in lockdown, everyone in their homes, they're fearful about getting the virus and all of this. And a lot of people, they were just being emotionally drained in that situation. I like this acronym for fear because I think it's very simple and to the point, which it says fear is false evidence appearing real. You know, the things that we are more anxious and most fearful about it, 90% of them, they don't actually happen. The things that we are most fearful about it is, you know, they don't actually happen. But the fear, why do you think fear is going to increase the pain? I don't know if it ever happened to you. You open your, you, are st you started to feel something and then you decided to go to Dr. Google. How many of you did that? You know, you go on the internet and you just type there whatever you're feeling. And you type there and you started reading. And somehow, it seems like Google gives you all the worst possible options. And as you started reading, you read the first line, the second line, and then you started feeling the things that is being described there. And you are like, that's what I have it, right? And because we are so fearful about the condition, and because we are so fearful, guess what happened? We started feeling it in our bodies. Our minds is actually playing a trick on us, telling us that we have something when we actually don't. The problem only develops when fear or pain grows out of proportion to the danger. I think this is so important because we're supposed to be aware about the problem. But when we are fearful about the problem, that's when something really strikes and our pain gets worse. Because if we are fearful about the problem, we are going to be stressed and all of this. Now, I'm not saying that you should, you know, you shouldn't look into what, you know, the cause of your pain is. Yes, you should look and be attentive to those things, but don't be fearful about it. Because when you are fearful about it, you know, the things get worse, just like the example I gave when we search things on the internet, for example. Now, I want to tell you this story. The author of the book, uh, Dr. Paul Brand, um, he tells his personal experience with pain. When he was in medical school, he was studying about, um, let me say it right, cerebrospinal meningitis. And he was studying that, and as he's studying, at that time, we are talking about this book was written in the 
um, late 1800s, early 1900s. So at that time, it was a dreadful condition because there was no antibi antibiotics, and most of the people that got it, they died. So he was studying about it, and then two weeks after, he got sick. Now, as he got sick, he went home, and guess what was the first thing he thought he had? Cerebrospinal meningitis. And he thought he had that, and he is like, oh no, I just can't go to school, I can't work, and I need to do something about it. So he went to, to the hospital, and one of the doctors that they were in the hospital was actually his teacher. And so as he's there, he's trying, he's telling him, so I know what I have, I know I have cerebrospinal meningitis, I want you to give me this and this and that because I know that that's what I have. And the doctor just told him, just, you know, calm, just relax, and we're ju just going to give you this pill. And he's like, what is this pill for? And he says, you know, just take it, you know, just trust me, you are going to be fine. And as he goes, you know, as the panic started settling in his body and he thought he had um, all the things together, and then he got to the hospital, he took the thing, and then he's asking the doctor, let's do some tests because I wanted to just confirm, I know what I have already. And three days later, there was the funniest thing that happened to him, he said, that three days later, he had the fastest, fastest recovery of cerebrospinal meningitis. <laughs> the fastest one that he could ever imagine. He says, when he went to the, the doctor, came to discharge him, and he's thinking to himself, what was that pill that the doctor gave me? And the doctor came into him and said, you were 25% sick of influenza, and you were 75% sick of fear of cerebrospinal meningitis. Not the disease itself, but the fear of it. And he continues saying, oh, let me get this right, okay. When patients come to you complaining of pain out of proportion to its physical cause, he says, perhaps you will be more understanding. They feel real pain. As a doctor, you will be treating their fears as you, as you treat, as well as their organic illness or injury. It's so interesting, he was sick of influenza, of course, but most of that was because of his fear of having cerebrospinal meningitis. He was so fearful about it, but did it actually happen? No. So the big question that comes up, how do we manage pain? Because we've been talking about it all along, and how should we actually deal with it? But I want you to give you a few things, how can you manage pain in a mental perspective, I'm not going to be sharing a lot of things that you can do as a natural remedies, but I want to share with you things that we can do from our conscious side. Pain takes place in the mind, and what calms the mind will enhance my ability to cope with pain. There is something very interesting, is that when our mind is calmer, we actually, our perception of pain lessens. And there is something interesting because um, in other words, manage pain is also about doing something about it, coping with it. So we talked about the three stages of pain. We talked about the stage one, which is the signal, the stage two, the message, and the three, which is the response. And I want to tell you this story, which is very interesting. In the book, um, Paul Brand, he also mentioned this story where he was um, dealing with um, let me get this name correct as well for you. He was dealing with, oh, what's the name? He was having a problem before, his, before he had a surgery, he was dealing with a lot of pain from um, gallstones. And that's something that is very, very painful. And as he was dealing with that, there was one evening that his pain, he just could not bear the pain. And he was in bed and trying to sleep. And what he decided to do, he decided to go outside. And as he went outside, he started listening to the birds singing. He started, you know, as he's walking, he was walking barefoot. And he started, you know, it was a gravel path. So as he was is walking there, he started having um, also, you know, that uncomfortable sensation when he was walking barefoot. But it's interesting that he said something is that after he went in his walk, he was singing and all those things, it just seems like his pain went away. By, and, he, and he says, by walking on the shell path, the gravel path, I generated new, more tolerable stage one signals. Because there were so many messages coming into his mind that he actually forgot about the main thing about pain. 
which had flooded the spinal gate, affecting stage two. And attentiveness to the world around me influenced stage three, with bringing about a state of calmness and serenity. That's something very interesting, which is called mindfulness. You know, I'm not talking about, you know, that type of meditation, but there is something called mindfulness that is actually very interesting and something that we actually lack today. We are always worried about the future and the past, and we are not mindful about the present moment we are living in. A lot of times we go on our walks and we are walking around and we are in nature, but we are always heads down in our phones, right? But it's interesting because we are never mindful about our present moment, and that's one of the things he says, that the attentiveness, the mindfulness to the word around him influenced stage three, which brings about a stage of calmness and serenity. So when we talk about pain, there is something very interesting. Now, I'm not saying it, that we should do it in a bad way, but you know, treating pain in a sense is also about distracting it. What do I mean by that? There are things that can help us in, in, a, in a conscious level when we do for the pain. For example, it says when you are confronted with intense pain, look for activities that will fully absorb you. The last thing we want to do when we are having pain is to go and do something, right? But it's actually, if we only stay to ourselves and we are always in our room, closed, guess what's going to happen? Our pain is going to increase because that's the only message that is coming in our bodies. M look for activities that will fully absorb you, mentally or physically. Look for conscious distractions and discipline yourself to be active. It's really hard to be active when we are having pain, right? Especially if when we are being active, makes our pain to be worse. But it's something interesting that happens that there are ways that we can use in order to distract pain, in order to manage the pain at a conscious level. First of all, I have it there, going for a walk in nature. It's interesting, but when we spend time outside, we actually start to feel better. Now, sometimes it's understandable. If walking makes you feel, you know, if it makes the pain worse, and this and that, I'm not saying that you shouldn't use medications at all in that case either, but what I'm trying to say is that there are ways that we can use in order to trigger these responses in our body. Another one is singing. You would be surprised, but when we are calmed, when our mind and our mental status is calmed, we actually, you know, lessen even our pains. And also scripture reading. I think this is so important, and we're going to go through a story in the Bible shortly that talks a little bit about that as well. One of the things is also thinking that, you know, to be active. Our sensations are our servants, not our masters. A lot of times we see it, especially um, when we become more and more idle, is that, you know, all these problems started happening. You know, I, at least back in my country, I know a, f a, f a few people that, especially when they got retired and they, were, and they were always in their homes, what happened after a while is that they lost this purpose in life. And because they were not doing anything, they just started declining in their health. So important for us to be active, which sometimes is something that is very hard, especially in our day, but it's something that is very, very important. But also be active in doing good things. There is a quote from the Ministry of Healing that says that good deeds are twice a blessing, benefiting both the giver and the receiver of the kindness. You know, did you know that one hour of volunteer work a week, it's um, the happiness increase that you have from it is as if your salary had increased by 20,000 a year. The happiness that you have from serving others, the happiness level. And I think that's so interesting because we live in a world that everyone is by themselves. But it's very important for us to be active in doing good. The consciousness of right doing is one of the best medicines. You know, look for things that you can do for others. And then you're going to realize that, you know, you don't even, after a while, you're just like, oh, where is my pain going? Where did it go? Right? And it says, it is one of the best medicines for disease bodies and minds. When the mind is free and happy from a sense of duty well done and the satisfaction of giving happiness to others, the cheering, uplifting influence brings new life to the whole being. 
when we look, you know, to help others, we are actually the ones that receive the greatest blessing of it. You know, especially at the Lifestyle Center, when we have our different guests, and you, you hear all the testimonies, how they've been blessed in their health, you know, and we look to ourselves and we are like, I think we were the ones that were helping them that actually got the greatest blessing. I also want to talk about something that is called the relaxation response, which is um, not necessarily um, the, the type of meditation that we have, you know, today that is being told, that new age kind of thing, but it's more related into um, spending time doing something that is relaxing. And it says, in one study, the majority of patients who had failed to find relief for chronic pain in conventional ways reported at least a 50% reduction in their pain after training in the relaxation response. In another three-fourths of the patients reported moderate to great improvement. Now, you look at that and you're like, how can it be that something just like triggering that relaxation response actually gave them relief to pain? And how do you trigger the relaxation response? That's the question. Well, is doing things, for example, when you go in a walk, for example, when you are reading the Bible, when you are reading, you know, a book, that actually helps to trigger that response because our heart rate is going to go down, our respiratory rate goes down and triggers that response in our bodies. What about prayer? Do you think prayer... You want me to go back? You got to... Yes. Yes. Let me go back. And, you know, what about prayer? Do you think prayer has something to do with our pains? Do you think that it can actually help? Well, I want to share a study with you that I find that one of the, actually my favorite stories, um, studies of all time. It says, first of all, prayer helps us to cope with pain by moving our mental focus away from our body's complaint. It's so interesting that everything that happens in our lives, we can always find something negative to complain about it. But just like we always find something negative, there is always something positive to be cheerful about it. You know, perhaps you may have a friend that they can find a problem for every solution. Do you have that friend? Not a solution for every problem. He finds a problem for every solution. And a lot of times we are being that friend, which everything that happens to us, we always look for the negative things and focus on that. So in this study, they as, um, assess the importance of in intercessory prayer. They had 393 cardiac patients, and in that they you know, decided to check their complications, heart failure, pneumonia, antibiotic use, medical ventilation, and cardiac arrest. With the patients that you know, they were praying for, or the patients themselves were praying, they had 27 complications, eight heart failure, three pneumonia, three antibiotic use, medical ventilation they had zero, and cardiac arrest three. But now it's interesting. Guess what happened with the patients that they weren't praying or they did not have someone praying for them? It almost doubled. It says complications went from 27 to 44, from eight to 20, medical ventilation from zero to 12, and cardiac arrest from 3 to 14. Do you think prayer has something to do with our physical health? It definitely has. What about gratitude? In his book, um, Alphonse Coral, his book is called A Tour Around My Garden. He writes that we can complain because rose bushes have thorns or rejoice because thorns have roses. There is always something that is going to be negative in a way but we can always find something to be cheerful about it, even in our difficult circumstances. And this, this is a Bible story that I want us to talk about, which is in 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 10. You know, Paul is talking about here that he had a thorn in the flesh. You know, a lot of times we think about the thorn in the flesh. What was that? You know, the question comes, what he had? You know, um, and it was actually, a lot of the scholars, they say that was something related to his vision. Because since the first time that he had seen Jesus, his vision wasn't as good as before. And it's interesting that he continues saying, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations that was given me a thorn in the flesh. How many of you do not have a thorn in the flesh? 
No hands go up. Why? Because there is something we all deal with. So we need to learn how do we care for it. There were, the messenger of Satan should buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. And he continues saying, For this thing I, I besought the Lord thrice, that I might depart from me. He was seeking the Lord and saying, Lord, why am I having this pain? Why this and this and this and this is happening? And he continues, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength in, is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest in me. We can choose to be fearful, or to be, you know, really scared about our current situation. Or we can choose to look up and see that, you know, there is hope beyond that. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. That's such a, a paradoxical paradox, you know, that we have here. How can you take pleasure in infirmity? Something that is hurting you. And that's why, you know, I like to entitle this lecture, The Gift That Nobody Wants. Because pain is something that no one wants, but it's something that everybody needs. Because if we do not have pain, we are going to put ourselves in places that are so harmful to us. We are going to be harming ourselves, for example, just like the little boy. If we don't have pain, we're going to touch something hot, we're going to get burned, and we're going to actually be harming ourselves more and more. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake, for when I'm weak, then I'm, st I'm strong. And he says, I rarely feel grateful for the fact of pain, but I almost always feel grateful for the message that it brings. You know, pain itself is not a comfortable thing, but the message that it brings is a message to give us health and to guide us into the right way as well. And also when we talk about chronic pain management, Chronic pain management succeeds when the patient accepts the possibility of living a useful life in the presence of pain. And that's hard to do it, right? When you are having pain and you're still trying to, it's like, you know, swimming upstream. But there is something very important for us to realize that we can live a useful life even in the presence of pain. And that also there is hope for our pains and aches. There is a way there is hope that we can um, be relieved from it. And there is a quote that I want to share in closing that I think it's very fitting for the things we're talking about. Um, from a Portuguese writer, he writes, There are ships sailing to many ports, but not a single one goes where life is not painful. And I think this is so important because we all, all of us in this room, we are going to deal with pain. And we all probably have dealt, you know, we've had pain before. But there is an important thing which is, is about, you know, going and swimming upstream in a sense. is knowing how to deal with pain and doing something about it. The health of the body depends largely on its attentiveness to the pain network. If you have a male that keeps coming to your house telling, that something, we, you know, that there, something is going to happen and you keep ignoring the mail and you always throw it away, always throw it away, always throw it away, guess what's going to happen? You know, whatever has to happen, you're going to probably miss your appointment or, you know, you're going to be a great danger than, you know, addressing the mail at that time. And I think this is so important for us because we are in a society, as I said, that we think that pain is the problem. But pain is not the problem. Pain is actually the thing that points us to the problem. But if we look at pain as the symptom, guess what's going to happen? We are always going to be treating the wrong causes and we are never going to get to the root cause of our diseases. I hope you are blessed by this lecture and we will close with a word of prayer. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day and your abundant blessings. And as we think about pain and the ways that it can be uncomfortable, we say that we thank you for giving us um, this reaction in our body because it's through that that we are able to know the dangers we are facing. Father, we pray that you bless each one of us in this room and continue to bless this conference. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.